You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about sports in the state of Michigan? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media, the show that provides research and statistics about all the Detroit and Michigan sports teams, whether fans like it or not, and detects, exposes, and reveals actual and hidden facts and truth that the mainstream media doesn't want you to know. No junk, no entertainment, no homerism, no slappiness, no coddling, no pop culture, no conspiracy theories, no opinions, no shilling, and no fluff. Head over to our website, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, podcast.com follow us on twitter periscope and instagram at michigan underscore truth and like and share our verified facebook page the michigan sports truth podcast also listen to us on spreaker Castbox, iHeartRadio, google podcast apple podcast via itunes and spotify and like staples media on facebook <laughs> The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent or compete against any mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It is also not for entertainment or debating purposes. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And it is for every sports fan's own good because the truth is out there. And Akil Badu just struck out as we welcome you to another episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media. Taylor Phillips and Ed Smith and Frank Bajner again. My opening statement, just when we thought the Tigers' water was going to find its level after being swept in Cleveland, they dragged themselves back in at Minute Maid Park. Same goes for Eli Brooks. Ed, what is your opening statement? My opening statement is that Steve Eisman just had himself a magnificent week as he absolutely just fleeced the Washington Capitals, and all things are looking up and up. Trust the Eiser plan. Oh, yeah. Frank, I'd say the same thing if I were you. <laughs> well, to be quite honest, my opening statement is right along the line of that, because even though he and I didn't share them at all, Steve Eiserman is showing that he's committed to turning this Red Wings roster around, and he got a very nice haul at the last minute of the trade deadline for Anthony Mantha from the Washington Capitals. And I'll say it again, trust the Eiser plan, and I'm probably going to say it a few more times tonight. Yes, sir. So that's our opening statement segment. Before we get started, we want to remind everyone to download the all-new social sports mobile app, Big Hit, and enter the referral code STABLES for STABLES Media when you sign up. Capital S, lowercase letter B in the middle. Available on the Apple App Store and Google Play. Download the Big Hit app and sign up with the referral code STABLES for 1,000 free big coins and spread the word. Capital S, lowercase letter B in the middle. Let's start on the Tigers. Uh, Akil Badu has been red, red hot. I know he struck out. He's, he's one for three, but he got an RBI double to start off with. Akil Badu with another home run to dead center, I think it was two nights ago. Badu just keeps swinging this red-hot bat, and he's not even messing around. The Tigers uh, got swept in Cleveland, but they've taken the first two games in Houston, and now they lead six to nothing in the top of the fifth. Two outs, bases empty, two two pitch, and a punch out on Nico Goodrum. Strike three called on the outside corner. Goodrum didn't like it, but I thought that was the right call. That was right on the corner. Got to swing that bat, Nico. Tigers uh, almost on the verge of uh, sweeping those Houston Astros. The Astros have a very powerful offense, but the Tigers pitching has shut them down. Casey Mize, seven innings, zero runs whatsoever, four hits, two walks, seven strikeouts in Houston. And then Matt Boyd, six and two-thirds innings. He got a lot of run support, and he got a win. And now Michael Fulmer in the starting rotation. He's starting to get back into the groove. So, uh, Ed, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to Frank Ed, the Tigers are starting to develop, at least some of them. Which is something that you wanted to see if you have any hopes of this rebuild uh, taking off or getting off to any steam or any uh, type of development uh, or get into any type of role, per se. Now, first and foremost, you got to start with the, the absolute tear that Akil Badu has been on. Uh, the way he's been hitting the ball, he is now, as of, as of live recording, he's hitting at the 400 mark, batting average-wise. Granted, it is only midway through the first full month of the season, but consider the fact that this is a rookie and this is his first slate of seeing actual major league uh, competition. The fact that he's raking and he's not just giving you hits, he's giving you variety, he's giving you home runs, he's giving you multi-base hits. Uh, he's also not being a pole hitter. He's shown and proving that not only he can hit to the opposite side of the field, he can hit with power uh, to the opposite field as well. I think most, if not all of his homers, have been either to center field 
or the opposite side of the field. None of them has been pulled to uh, straightaway right field, which is, uh, is, is saying something. Now, obviously, if you're a Tigers fan and you've been watching this, this franchise for a long time, you kind of have seen this type of story before where the star of the year, a sensation pops up, and then he quickly fizzles out. You saw it before with Chris Shelton, and you saw it before uh, after that with Brendan Bosch. If there's something to be at least a little bit hopeful for in the case of Badu, it's showing that he has good awareness of the strike zone. He really reads the pitches well from what we have seen. And like I mentioned before, with his ability to hit the opposite side of the field and for power as well, gives more, uh, you know, a more complete feel to his game. Doesn't make him as more of a one trick pony per se, uh, with him being a left handed hitter. So factor that in and the fact he, he appears to have some good defense on him as well, as we saw, uh, stop a, a ground ball earlier in the game. You can, it's, it's, it's really a tremendous thing to see with his development so far. And you only hope for more. Now, as you mentioned, Taylor, with the starting pitching over the past two games with Mize and Boyd, I mentioned this last week. I'll keep mentioning it again. If you have, if you need to have any hopes of winning in this league, it starts with your pitching, specifically your starting rotation. And when you have your your, uh, your starting pitchers giving you quality starts where they can go five, six, seven innings, put in decent work, give up two runs, three runs, or sometimes no runs at all in the case of Casey Mize, it makes things much more easier uh, in terms of game plan and strategy for the rest of the game. You don't have to rely so much on your bullpen, especially when we know the Tigers' bullpen is very, very shaky. And obviously, once a, a batter, once a pitcher gets run support, as what we saw with, with Boyd last night, it builds up his confidence as well, and then which in turn leads to a better performance overall on the mound. So factor that in, and knowing for the fact that the Tigers, they got wins over Plesak and Kluber and, uh, and Granke, uh, over the over of this early start of the season gives you some hope as to wow no you shouldn't think of them as any type of contender for the postseason or for the division so you never know with how this division usually goes it does leave you hopeful and more optimistic for what they can do in the future now I will say and we'll probably touch on this a little bit the fact that they're doing this without Miguel Cabrera is telling in more ways than one but we'll get to that momentarily yeah Miguel Cabrera I want to dig up his uh, war replacement uh, levels uh, dug up by uh, the one and only Jeff Moss of the Detroit Sports Rag let's see here these are Miguel Cabrera's war the last few years. Wins above replacement. 2017, negative 0.2. 2018, positive 0.7. 2019, negative 0.4. And 2020, that's last year, positive 0.3. And Moss tweeted at How About It 91, he isn't even a replacement level player any longer. The best thing that could happen to the Tigers is lose him for the year. So... That explains why the Tigers are better off nowadays without Miguel Cabrera, unlike their recent past, except they just couldn't quite win a World Series back then the last almost decade or so. So the Miguel Cabrera era is uh, pretty much over with. Frank, you're up next. Oh, that's some uh, interesting numbers that Moss is able to dig up regarding Miguel Cabrera's war. Mm -hmm. And it's also a testament to the rest of the team that, hey, no Cabrera in the lineup. No problem. We can still go out and win games, so give credit where it's due. I mean, as for the Tigers and obviously Akil Badu being the big story, him being the Rule 5 draft pick and never seeing anything above high A until this year. I mean, I don't mean to be somebody who wants to rain on this parade, but of course, I think we have to take into consideration that scouts don't really have a ton of film on him. Obviously, if he's somebody who had never been above high A in the past, they're not going to really look too much into him and scout him. Well, now that he's coming up here and actually done very well, you guys have to wonder, how long is it going to be before MLB scouts start really focusing in on him and film study and saying, okay, these are his weaknesses, here's how we can exploit him, and you have to wonder if it's going to be by the time May rolls around or if it's going to be... June, July, or even after the All-Star break. I mean, we saw this in years past with names like Chris Shelton, with Quentin Berry, with Brennan Bosch, name a few. Now, am I hoping that he is like that? Absolutely not. The dude's been a very nice story. I don't think anybody expected somebody to come from the highest level being high A ball to go and end up being sensational in their first month of playing in the show so there's that and then i think we also have to take into consideration the pit pitching as well i mean matt boyd he had a great outing the other night against the astros 
I mean, we saw what Michael Fulmer was doing tonight, and even Casey Mize, too. Now, everyone says, well, Mize is probably going to be the piece that's part of your future. He finally gets his first major league win, pitches very well, gets some run support. Now, Boyd, I've been kind of bullish on, to be quite honest with you, because he had seemingly Me too. shown that he can be really well, and then other nights that he just looked god off, and I was thinking, why couldn't you have traded him sooner and maybe you get a haul for him? But, you know, if he can show that he can be consistent on a regular basis, then okay. I'll say, hey, I was wrong about him, and he's showing that he belongs here. Fulmer, I had heard, was touching 97 on the gun tonight, and, you know, I'll tip my cap to him for it. But is this something that's going to be one-game wonder where he goes back to just being a long-relief guy once uh, Julio Tehran returns to the lineup? Or does he possibly say, you know what, I found my groove, I'm back. So we'll see what happens. I'm cautiously optimistic for Fulmer. And, of course, I think we're starting to see guys start to develop and come along, especially under A.J. Hinch being his first year as the manager. I don't think this is a team that's going to be in the absolute basement of the major leagues, but I don't see them being competitive in the division for a while yet. No, and um, quickly, Frank, to piggyback off your point, I think uh, one more thing, if you could add on to your point about Michael Homer, it also depends on his health. His health is going to be a real key indicator for how his performance will go for the rest of this year. That too, Ed. Yeah, and I just got word that Nomar Mazar left tonight's game with a left abdominal strain. So that's not good news for the Tigers. But uh, I was going to touch on something. If the Tigers end up in the uh, seller's market yet again, and Matt Boyd continues to have stellar starts, whether he wins or loses or not, I know he finally got a win last night. But um, speaking of Boyd being traded, he could be much better trade bait if the Tigers uh, still have a bad record. And uh, by the uh, trade deadline, like midseason or something like that, and Matt Boyd continues to really pitch well, like he was doing last night, if, if he keeps that up throughout uh, at least like two or three months of the season, then what could happen? Think about that, guys. So uh, Miguel Cabrera is on the uh, 10-day injured list with a left bicep strain, and Julio Teheran was transferred from the 10-day IL to the 60-day IL with a shoulder strain. So there goes one valuable starter. Uh, that's not an excuse. I think the, the rest of the team could step up. And Jason Castro just put the Astros on the board with a two-run home run. That's all former. It's now 6-2 to two Tigers. Still in the fifth inning, two outs, bases empty now. So moving on, the Red Wing, their tank watch before we get to their trades with the What's Your Great segment. They are six worse in the NHL at 15, 23, and 6 with 36 points. They swept the Carolina Hurricanes recently at PNC Arena in Raleigh, North Carolina. And the Red Wings are uh, putting some dents in their tank. That's going to ruin their chances at the uh, at a top three uh, lottery pick. And that's not good. The Red Wings are supposed to tank even further than that. But that leads me to uh, the trades that we're going to get to right now with the What's Your Great segment brought to you by the Vigit Sports Mobile app. Pencils down, everyone. It's time to find out what's your grade. First off, the Red Wings traded defenseman Patrick Nemeth to the Colorado Avalanche for a 2022 fourth-round draft pick. Ed, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to Frank. Ed, what is your grade on the Red Wings trading Patrick Nemeth to the Avs? Uh, in terms of overall what it means uh, for development and, and whatnot, what, what you're going to use in the future, potential assets, I'll give this one a B-, minus. Um, I think with, uh, with the low-level draft pick that you're getting, you're essentially using an expired contract before to get off your books and, and replacement for this one. So when you factor in that, yeah, this could be a potential flip or you could be using it just for sheer draft capital for death purposes, got no problem with it. I think that the more intriguing aspect of this is Joe Sackick and Steve Eisman are doing deals with each other. That's crazy when you think about it. It actually makes me, excuse me, feel a little bit old knowing that, you know, I used to watch these two play against each other and now here they are as GMs making deals with each other. So that's a little bit of a, a crazy coincidence. But still, overall, my grade would be a C plus B minus uh, type of median average. I'll take a B minus. Frank, what is your grade on the Nemeth trade? I'll give it a B minus as well. I really didn't think they were going to get much in return for him because Nemeth is nothing more than a depth defenseman on a cup contending team. And Colorado's obviously trying to go for a Stanley Cup this year. Add some depth to their blue line. So the fact that Steve at least got a mid-round draft pick out of it, 
I give it a B minus, and also it does feel kind of unusual to see him and Joe Sackick making deals with each other when those two played against each other and probably one of the fiercest rivalries in all the NHL in the 90s. Yeah, and of course we remember, everyone remembers the Red Wings Avalanche blood rivalry, of course, but now it's turning to a much friendlier rivalry with Eisenman and Sackick as uh, front office men at least. Maybe both general managers. Yeah, both general managers. Yeah, definitely. So, next up, the Red Wings traded Brian Lashoff to the Columbus Blue Jackets for David Savard, and then traded David Savard to the Tampa Bay Lightning for a 2021 fourth-round draft pick from the Ottawa Senators in a three-team trade. Ed, what is your grade on the uh, Brian Lashoff David Savard three team trade B plus and this was the deal that I was thinking of in, in terms of my referencing uh, to the earlier discussion of the Nina trade the fact that you're getting rid of Lashoff's contract for a fourth rounder uh, which could be used for death purposes again not so much a, a difficult mm-hmm. move than man what a suave GM bit, but still it's a move that a reasonable GM and a good one should have to know the ability to make under any given circumstance so knowing that I'll give this one an even B and even B, Frank, what's your grade on the uh, Brian Lashoff, David Savard trade? This one I might go a little higher on. I'm tempted to go. I'm going B plus, maybe even fringe A minus, just for the fact that Lashoff was kind of that 4A defenseman, not probably just stuck between the AHL and the mm-hmm. NHL. And the fact that Steve was able to get a fourth round pick for him is just amazing in and of itself. It just shows how smart of a GM he is. He got in on the David Savard deal to Tampa Bay, saying, you know what, we're going to throw Brian Lash off in, we'll take some of Savard's salary, and then you just give us a fourth-round pick, and it all works out in the end. So I'm kind of that fringe B+, plus, A-, minus, just the fact that he knew to get in on, take some of Savard's contract, and turn it into a draft pick as well. All right. I'll go with a B plus, just to be fair. So, Ed? Give it a B plus or it from a mid range B to B plus. Frank, a B plus to an A minus. I'll range it. B plus. Pretty simple. Next up, the Red Wings traded defenseman John Merrill to the Montreal Canadiens for a fifth round draft pick of this year and prospect Hayden Verbeek. Sounds like a familiar last name. Ed, we'll go with you and then. We'll go to Frank. Ed, what is your grade on the Merrill Verbeek trade? Again, uh, a chance to upgrade at a similar position uh, by moving on from this pick. Nothing more, nothing less. But I still like the move in terms of acquiring assets. So I get this one B minus. All right, Frank, how about you? Well, you mentioned the name Verbeek sounded familiar. That's because Hayden Verbeek is the nephew of Red Wings assistant GM Pat Verbeek. So mm-hmm. they ended up acquiring somebody who obviously got some family in the front office. I'm not sure if we'll ever see him play a game in Detroit or not. I haven't really got a chance to look at Hayden's stats and if he was in the AHL or not with Laval Rocket, which is the Canadiens AHL affiliate. But the fact that Steve was able to get some draft capital out of the deal makes it a solid deal. I'm giving this a, a B just for the fact that he got some draft capital, whether or not Hayden Verbeek cracks the NHL lineup or not remains to be seen, but draft capital is good enough for me on this one. So B. All right. I'll go with a B as well. Mid range. I'll range it between a B minus and a mid range B, but I'll still give it a mid range B like 84%. So um, last but not least, they traded Anthony Mantha to the Washington Capitals for forwards Richard Panic and Jacob Rana and a first and second round draft pick. Ed, what is your grade on the Mantha Panic Verana trade? This was the one I was waiting to discuss the most, and frankly, I gotta give this one what everyone else has been probably talking about it and discussing as generalizing it as a solid A. The fact that Mantha was to be honest, he was frankly uh, widely underperforming here, at least in terms of the standards that the fans were expecting from him. Uh, he was a healthy scratch for some of the time. I don't know it was the fact that he didn't, he was, he wasn't able to get along, or either thrive or feel comfortable with Blash Hill and his coaching, or he didn't have the right supporting cast around him. Either way, things were just not going well, and Irishman recognized that. So let's—he figured, let me just get him, swap him. For a guy who's essentially the same player in every bit and way uh, in Vrana, who, by the way, is a 2014 first-round pick. Eisman just loves collecting 2014 
uh, first round picks. We saw it with Fabry, saw it with Ryan. I see it here. But in terms of that, not just the swap that you're getting, you're also getting a first rounder for this year and a second rounder for next year. So that's a, a potential extra pick you can use if you want. You can either flip that to get another guy or trade up in the draft to get a guy that you may you, you thought you didn't have a chance at before. Or again, just sit back and let the let the BPA, best player available, fall to you. It's simple. And the fact that you're getting another draft pick with that for next year as well, which, again, a multitude of scenarios you can do with that, all that in exchange for Anthony Matha, you got a great haul in return. So Irisman, you know, if you want to say he fleeced Washington, that probably may be too strong of a word to use. But I felt he definitely got the better end of this deal. Now, Washington, obviously, they're going to get a fine player in Matha. In fact, he scored in his first game with the Caps either last night or tonight. But uh, so this could be a trade where both both teams get what they want. But I really like how Eisman approached it. And for that, I'm giving him an A grade. Yeah, I would do the same. I would give him the same grade as well. I think both teams won that trade. Capitals get a valuable player in Mantha. The Red Wings get like an overhaul for him. Panic, Verena, and two picks. Frank, your turn. What is your grade on that Mantha trade? Break it down. I am going to give this an A with possibly on the verge of giving it an A plus because I believe this is probably the best trade that Iserman has made since he's become the GM of the Red Wings. Because look, Anthony Mantha, like Ed said, was kind of in a funk here. I mean, whether or not he was not getting along with the coaching staff or players in the locker room, that's another story in and of itself. So he needed a change of scenery. So Steve Eiserman ships him off to Washington and gets an amazing haul return. Gets Jakob Verana, who was a 2014 first round pick, which uh, Steve apparently must have a thing for collecting with guys like Robbie Fabry in the past, as well as Adam Ernie, who on a side note is leading the team in goals scored. Raise your hand if you thought that was going to happen. And also he gets Richard Ponick, who is kind of been a solid uh, role player there on various teams i know he had he was solid when he was in tampa with eisenman as the gm for a couple of seasons he also had a nice season in chicago one year and i believe he also had a nice stint in toronto as well i'm not sure if he fits into the long-term plans of the future but at least is somebody who kind of bring in and get a chance to show what he can do given that he's been around the league for a few years and of course Verona, from all the highlights I've seen of him, looks very familiar to one Pavel Datsuk in terms of his moves. So we'll see what he can do here, and he'll probably be, he'll definitely be a key piece to rebuilding for the future. But the draft picks, the first rounder for the 2021, the Wings now have two. So what Steve does with either pick, I don't know if he'll go best player available or possibly use that second one to move up and get somebody. Or that remains to be seen also the second rounder that he got for 2022. That's just another ad. That's just another feather of the cap that he's doing whatever he can do to acquire as many assets as he can because it's all part of trusting the Iser plan, which is something that we have harped on pretty much as long ever since Steve became the GM of the Red Wings. And he's shown that he's committed to doing it and making sure he gets a good return. And I believe he's. He actually was on uh, Stoney and Jansen the other day on 97.1, and he said that that when people say, you know, why couldn't you have waited? Maybe you could have dealt somebody like Mantha at the end of the season right before the draft and gotten a better return. Steve said, quote, when there's a, you feel like you can get a good return for somebody at that moment, you make the move. And Steve did just that, getting the nice haul he got for Mantha. So that's why I'm giving this – a to almost damn near an A plus because this is the best move that Eisenman has made thus far. I'm sure he might make another good one down the line, but we'll see. We'll see what happens if his next one ends up top in this one. So, also correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't Vranic, uh Vrana play with Philip Sedina uh, when they were with Sweden a couple of years back? Um, oh. I don't know about that, but I do know that Vrana was a key. He actually was a member of the Capital Stanley Cup winning team in 2018 and right. played in all but one playoff game. So he's at least got some playoff experience, too. And that will come in valuable when, you, when when this team eventually does make that next step and some of these young players who have never been in the postseason before get that experience. You need to rely on a guy uh, who's been there before to help uh, tell you, teach you the ins and outs, how to calm your nerves, how to maneuver, and how to perform. 
That's why they have, you know, that's why for some reason they brought back guys like Filippola, who had that, ex- excuse me, who had that experience from way back. Now, once, when do you consider this young core that potentially that we're getting here? Vrana, well, I wouldn't say he's young, but still, he'd be part of the of that building core for the next generation, so to speak. Uh, Zadina here, you got Larkin. Uh, let's not forget the, that big uh, Moritz mm-hmm. Sider is on the way as well. So now. When you start adding that all together, you know you, pl- you, you all mm-hmm. you need, frankly, is a if you want to say an upgraded goaltender or at least backup goaltender, pluck up, fix up your issues at the blue line with, with better defensemen. This is the team to keep an eye on down the road. I would say within the next two years. Well, and it's interesting that you do say that. You mentioned guys like Cider and obviously Zadina and Larkin. You also have to remember mm-hmm. that Joe Valeno has just returned to North America from playing in Sweden. He was the guy who they got in the uh, first round in 2018 along with Zadina. So we'll see what he can do, and hopefully he gets a shot with a big club before the season ends. And even guys like uh, Jared McIsaac, who had been playing in Finland, and he's somebody who I think could uh, bolster that blue line as well. And you and can't forget about Lucas Raymond, who was the top pick in the most recent draft as well. well right. So it's going to right. start. We're slow. The results of the eyes are playing are starting to bear some fruit. It's still going to take time, but we're seeing results pay off. But yeah, see Lucas happens, Raymond. But see, but see what happens when you have competent level management, uh, you know, competent level GM and management uh, being able to do what they're supposed to do. Exactly. Right. Yeah, and Lucas Raymond, can't wait for him to uh, show off his Andres Athanasiu caliber skill on that ice in that rink. Can't wait. See what he's made of, for example. But yeah, results are paying off thus far. They just got to be proven on the ice later on. And that's going to be a blue fair ball. That's going to be uh, a single for Jamer Candelario. Harold Castro holds up at second. Six inning, one out. Runners on first and second. Six two Tigers. Belak still on the mound. He's thrown 38 pitches in relief for the Houston Astros. Tigers uh, trying to complete a three game sweep in Houston before heading to Oakland. So uh, Bobby Ryan is out for the rest of the season with an upper back injury. He could have been good trade bait as well, but Ed, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Frank. Just a quick take on this one. Ed, what do you think? It hurts for his development and it hurts what, for what potential chemistry could have built with the team. But like you said, it, it's a, it's possible that if he wasn't injured, he could have been another potential trade piece. And with Eisman making his comments, that as, as we as we heard Frank letting, uh, tell back to us, he could have been one of those guys that just like Mantha could have been on the table in terms of a potential deal. Uh, by the way, a quick uh, covered note, I would think that maybe about hearing all this talk uh, over the past couple of weeks of Luke Lindenning as a possible piece, maybe that was the smoke and mirrors cover that Eisman was using so he could have have not so much attention being paid to what he was about to do to, with Mantha. So there's that. But again, back on subject to Bobby Ryan, I think his injury could be a potential blessing in disguise because it allows him to stay in Detroit, learn more, develop more. And let's say, for example, he gets to play under a new coach next season that could actually uh, fast track his development and thus team chemistry even further. Yeah, definitely. Frank? That's a good point, I'm by the way. I'm going to echo what I said. I mean, losing Bobby Ryan for the season obviously hurts because you're not able to trade him and get another asset in return. But yeah. there's a possibility that he may end up re-signing, provided that he's willing to stay for a, not a super heavy deal where it's long-term and a lot of money. So we'll see if he ends up being back next year and being that locker room guy, possibly doing some uh, chemistry with Dylan Larkin and Tyler Bertuzzi and guys like that. So... It remains, it remains to be seen, and of course, the whole smoke and mirrors with Luke Glenn Denning possibly being traded, how that never <laughs> happened. Interesting comment, Ed, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see. I think we'll see. Well, it will, it will remain to be seen in the offseason if uh, Glenn Denning gets brought back or not via free agency or if he ends up going elsewhere. And hopefully it also means that we have a new coach as well. Oh, we're going to get a new coach. Hopefully it's Joe Gallant. So Jacoby Jones uh, walked his first time. He is, uh, he, yeah, he walked in replacement of Nomar Mazzara, who again left um, tonight's game with a left abdominal strain after almost taking almost getting hit by a pitch the 2-2 pitch swing and a miss jones goes down swinging tigers are done in the top of the six they lead six to two 
at Minute Maid Park in Houston. Astros only three hits. I'm not I'm not sure if Fulmer's gonna come back onto the mound, but uh anyway. I Pistons, say Fulmer I say Fulmer does one more inning and then we go on to the bullpen for the seventh. We'll see what happens. The Pistons tank watch third worst in the NBA at sixteen and thirty eight. Not much to talk about there. They trailed the Clippers fifty three to forty nine. Let's get a quick check in on them. Pistons lead 64-61 at Little Caesars Arena. They are back home from their West Coast swing, and the Clippers missed tying it up. That was off the heel right there, but uh, they got the rebound. Akil Badu, uh, a double and a run scored, by the way. Just want to check in on those Pistons, but um, not much to talk about in terms of the Pistons. But um, Eli Brooks, as we shift to college basketball, returns to the Michigan Wolverines for a fifth year. Ed, you have to be really, really happy about that. We'll start off with you. Go ahead. Pleasantly pleased and a little bit surprised. I figured, hey, you know, maybe he was either going to uh, potentially grad trans, you know, have a multitude of reasons to possibly leave the school. But the fact that he is coming back for his fifth year, very, very good. Very, very good to hear. I think it, it will help for not just the incoming freshmen, new players that are that are replacing the party ones to have that sort of staying power uh that helpful guide from last year would be beneficial especially knowing that mike smith is is going to be gone and we know that sean d brown is also gone so as well as isaiah liver is more than likely as well but so to have not too much turnover but just enough staying it helps very much so so when you factor that in and also knowing the fact that the inner competitor he's probably got the inner competitive streak to where he does not want his last memory uh, to be that miss uh, in the Elite Eight against UCLA when he had a chance to take the lead uh, after the rebounding of the Franz Wagner air ball just came very short on the putback attempt. So I think this, knowing that Eli may have may come back with something more to prove. And again, it bears worth repeating that assistant coach uh, Phil Martelli referred to him as Michigan's most important player. May not have been the best or most talented, but in terms of guys that you needed the most in key moments of situations or for general support, for journalism, making other players better around him. Eli Brooks was that guy, and it's very, very good to know that he's coming back for one more year. Yeah, Daniel Norris just took over for Michael Foreman to uh, start the bottom half of the sixth inning. I'm not even sure about that. I don't even know what A.J. Hintz is thinking here. Daniel Norris uh, falling behind in the count, two balls, one strike, on Alan Miss Diaz, who's over for 2. Norris to the stretch. Gets the signal, now the 2-1, high, ball three. Norris, uh, of course, still scuffling in that bullpen. Uh, I don't even know what Alavila was thinking, even putting Norris in the bullpen. I mean, Buck Farmer, yeah, still not good either. And Norris just issued a five-pitch walk against Diaz, who leads off the bottom half of the sixth inning by getting on first base with that aforementioned walk. Daniel Norris is a dud. Frank, you're up next. Eli Brooks staying put. I'm honestly surprised that he decided to come back, given the fact that he would have had his degree in hand and probably could have gone somewhere to play professionally. I don't know if he would have stuck in the NBA or been drafted, but he probably would have at least latched out with a summer league team and who knows, maybe gotten a chance to possibly make a team that way. But, you know, I think he wants another chance to possibly go and win it all given the fact that Michigan has a phenomenal recruiting class coming in next season, and he doesn't want to go. He didn't want to be around for going out losing against uh, hence the UCLA team that was one of the last teams to make the tournament. So this is a, probably one of the best things that could have happened to Juwan Howard in the offseason, especially with guys like with Mike Smith graduating, Shawnee Brown putting his name in the NBA draft, and – possibility of other guys like Franz Wagner leaving as well but we'll see if that happens so obviously big break for Juwan Howard and company to have Brooks back yeah Daniel Norris is now behind the count 2-0 and against Michael Brantley who is one for two Daniel Norris has now thrown six balls and one strike to begin the bottom half of that sixth inning jeez and their pitching coach out to talk with him Chris Fetter by name a Michigan Wolverines baseball pitching coach formerly so um yeah we'll we're gonna actually keep an eye on daniel norris um we're gonna we're gonna stay alive here by the way as uh, brantley digs in on two and oh and for the michigan state spartans they're gonna lose uh thomas kithier 
one of their forwards, he enters the transfer portal. I think there's a strike. Yep, looks like Brantley swung on and missed right there. Two balls, one strike. Not to mention the fact that uh, apparently Aaron Henry will be declaring for the NBA draft as well, which is yeah, kind that's of a big right. loss. Yeah, Aaron Henry, so that's two losses, one of them very big. So Norris, the 2-1, slider in there for strike two, 84 miles an hour, 2-2 two and two on Brantley. Morris trying to make a comeback. Six balls and three strikes thrown. Nine pitches total. So, yeah, looks like the Spartans are going to have to uh, move on forward. The 2-2 chipped foul toward the Tigers dugout on the first base side. Still two balls, two strikes on Michael Brantley. So, um, guys, um, Daniel Norris uh, trying to make a comeback after uh, he issued a, a five-pitch walk to uh, Alan Miss Diaz. But uh, well, still, their bullpen. Going back to Taylor, going back to Michigan State, having Tyler Kippier enter the transfer portal. With me being a Michigan State fan, I'm not at all shocked because he had far on favor with the coaching staff not playing in any of the remaining four games that they had. And also, I just don't think he really fit it at all because he was, I don't think he was well suited at playing the five, especially starting as well. I mean, I wish him the best. I think he's probably going to end up at a mid-American conference school or by some mid-major where I think he'll be a much better fit. But also this, there are people saying that this might possibly clear the way for Imani Bates to reclassify and join the team this fall, but that remains to be seen. Yep. That's true. Still two and two on Michael Brantley. He fouled the last two pitches off. There's Dusty Baker. Daniel Norris digging in. Checks Diaz at first. Now he kicks and delivers the 2-2. And a single to left center field just past short. Now there are runners on first and second. Nobody out. Diaz on second. Brantley on first. I don't know, guys. Daniel Norris just might blow it here. He's thrown 13 pitches. Brantley wins out on an eight-pitch battle against Daniel Norris. Yeah, I would have him only have him out here for the for the six. I wouldn't bring him back out for the seventh. And if need be, probably had the mind to get someone else warmed up just in case you have to yank him here. Right. Again, just my belief, I would have just stuck with with uh, with four more for one more inning and then gone to the bullpen in the seventh. I agree with you, especially instead of Daniel Norris in the sixth inning. Michael Fulmer has only thrown seventy eight pitches, forty nine yeah. of them strikes. That's yeah, pretty damn I, good. Yeah, I would especially if you already have a four run cushion with him. I would have given them just at least one more inning. Yeah, yeah, not put Daniel Norris on the mound early. Now there's Buck Farmer warming up in the bullpen. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, geez. I don't even know what A.J. Hinch is thinking. Seriously, I know the most of the bullpen is uh, bad, but uh, Norris and Farmer, they are two of the worst relievers that I have seen this year on this Tigers roster. Another one way high, and it's now one ball, one strike to Yuri Gurriel, who was 0 for 6 lifetime against Daniel Norris. A strikeout and a walk. One ball, one strike to count. A strikeout and a walk. That's about it. Just 0 for 6 lifetime. Norris takes a peek at the runners. Now the 1-1. One, one. Low and inside. Two balls, one strike. Daniel Norris is still struggling to throw a strike. Man, oh man. Wilson Ramos behind the dish. He keeps on hitting those home runs, by the way. Like we mentioned before earlier in this episode. Now the 2-1 high and outside. 3-1. One ball away from loading the bases with nobody out. And here comes the crowd. The Astros 0 for 1 tonight with runners in scoring position. The Tigers are 4 for 13 with runners in scoring position. Guriel waits. Norris checks the runners. Now the 3-1. Swing and a line drive. Base hit to center. Up the middle. And they're going to wave Diaz home. And he's going to score. 6 to 3 Tigers. Still nobody out. A.J. Hinch, I know you're... You're smarter than this, but I don't even know what the hell you were thinking there. God almighty. Jeez. Things just never change with Daniel Norris, by the way. Again, the bullpen, most of the bullpen may be bad, but Daniel Norris and Buck Farmer are the two worst relievers I've seen this year on the Tigers roster. And now, Tucker at the dish now, 0 for 2. Probably going to call play-by-play for this one until this sixth inning is over. Then we can sign off here. Tucker pops one up, foul, out of play, 0-1. One One strike the count on Tucker. Norris has now thrown 19 pitches. Still nobody out. It's 6-3 Tigers. Tucker just rubs his hands against one another. Tucker's the uh, potential tying run at the plate, guys. But uh, Norris is a little bit ahead of the count, 0-1. Norris gets the sign, checks the runners. Now the 0-1, curveball low, over on the inside corner, but low. 1-1 on Kyle Tucker, who is... 
hitting 300 against righties, but 167 against lefties. So, Ed, you had a point there. I, w- I definitely would have kept Michael Fulmer in for that sixth inning. They already had Daniel Norris warming up in that bullpen the last inning, and now a fastball inside, two and one. Or at least have him start the inning to see how he would do. Right. Fulmer? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, he, I, he's now complete. He, he's not really completely out of gas. He's still had plenty left in the tank. Only 78 pitches, like I mentioned before. The 2-1. Swing and a miss. 84. Tucker was swinging for the fences there, and that was in there. Tucker yeah, might that, have looked away. That was that was that was a, that was at least a smart thing to do. You know, the base is loaded. The guy's going to be looking to turn on one, pull him with an off-speed pitch. Yeah. Uh huh. Curveball, 84 miles an hour. Norse is one strike away from getting that first out. The two-two popped up, mm. and Tucker slams the bat. Mm. Gets under one, hit into left field. Grossman, a can of corn, one out. Runners remain. Brantley on second. And it looks like A.J. Hinch is going to go to the bull- bullpen. So uh, we're going to shift over to uh, Twitter Live. That That's going to do it for the uh, another episode here. Before we go, we want to remind everyone to download the all-new social sports mobile app, Big It. Enter the referral code STABLES for STABLES Media when you sign up. Capital S, lowercase letter B in the middle. Available on the Apple App Store and Google Play. Download the Big It app and sign up with the referral code STABLES for 1,000 free big coins. Gentlemen, Excellent job as always. That concludes another fine episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media. Ed, Darren Weiss, and I will be back next week. Frank Vagner will be out. Frank, uh, we'll talk to you in uh, two weeks. So, for right, Ed Smith, I'm looking forward to it. All right. For Ed Smith and Frank Vagner, and I'll be happy, Darren Weiss. This is Taylor Phillips signing off. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at DT2Phillips. Follow Ed Smith on Twitter and Instagram at EdSmith313. And follow Frank Vashner on Twitter and Instagram at Frank underscore Vashner. V-A-J-C-N-E-R. Thanks very much for listening, downloading, and sharing. And remember, the truth is out there. TTFN, ta-ta for now. Power to the people. Hit them with a high when you rest your case. Stay safe. The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent or compete against any mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It is also not for entertainment or debating purposes. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And it is for every sports fan's own good because the truth is out there. (laughs) 